Welcome to People Love Process. This movie will be our second episode of what I'm calling Over the Shoulder Vector Building. Again, unlike other content I produce for this channel, this will be recorded raw and I'll take discarded design directions from real world projects or old sketches I've never used for anything and bring them to life in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, you'll get to see the full build process, exploring color, rabbit trail stories, and more than likely me making mistakes or maybe Illustrator once again crashing, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All of it as if you were looking over my shoulder while I'll work. So with that said, let's get started. Um, the, pro the original project on this was, goes back... A year and a half ago or so uh, it was a metal fabrication uh, place based out of I believe Texas and they go by the name of ape and that's the logo you see in the flag that this character is holding uh, they do a lot of metal fabrication for different industries one of them is aerospace and some of the infrastructure that is needed by uh, NASA so uh, one of the, they have a character or their logo has an ape in it. Now I didn't design that, uh, but they wanted to do character based artwork using an ape. And one of the ideas we came up with was since you do stuff for NASA, uh, how about, um, you know, like an ape on the moon, you know, Planet of the Apes, if you will, but on the moon instead. And they like that idea. So this was one of the designs we created for them. Now, in the midst of coming up with other ideas, we said, hey, you have an ape. It's really popular. Bigfoot stuff is so popular. Now, let's just do your classic ape walking. And uh, me and Savannah worked on these together. So I set Savannah out to start sketching out ideas. She came back with this sketch here. And I like the general idea because it does look like the regular Bigfoot walking, but uh, this is where I'll art direct Savannah's sketch. And I'm looking at this, I go, well, it looks like his back leg is broken. Like you wouldn't see the bottom of his foot like this. That looks a little odd. So I need to fix that. Um, kind of looks like he has a comb over. I'm not so sure about the shape of his head at the top there. And he kind of has a pot belly. I'd like to make him a little more buff. He's always walking around. He's Bigfoot, cruising, hiking through the woods every day. So, you know, I don't think he's going to have a beer gut. And uh, I, I didn't like the, I forget what they call it under the nose, a little divot. I don't think that looks very ape-like because Bigfoot is supposed to be somewhat of a primate. So this is where... I'll look at Savannah's sketch, and then on top of it, I'll just start redrawing it. And so this shows you how I restyled or reworked the head so it had more of an ape feel to it. Uh, simplified some of the shapes, got rid of the detail here uh, in the top part of his lip, made him a little more buff in the chest area, not a beer gut, fixed the back foot down here, improved the front foot, made his feet a little bigger because he is big foot. So that made more sense doing that. And I think this is going to work great. Uh, once, once I have that all figured out, this is what we send to the client to approve. Now, when we sent these ideas along with other ideas we had, they had some silly ones like Ape Raham Lincoln, and they actually went with that one. I'm not going to show it because I don't really care for it that much. It's like, whatever, we'll do it. Um, pays the bills. And this is one of the ideas we presented. I liked it, and I was looking forward to building this, and they decide not to do it. So that's what we're going to build today. We're going to focus on uh, creating a Bigfoot, and then maybe at some point I'll work out type with it and turn it into a T-shirt. I don't know. I just think it'd be fun to build this out. It's a sketch. It's just been collecting dust on my hard drive, so we'll set this to 20, lock the layer. And once again, when I draw it out like this based off of my daughter's original sketch, I'm using a mechanical pencil when I'm drawing at this stage just to really think about the shapes and draw them precisely because I'm not going to redraw this again. I'm just going to build it. And I usually start 
with the face on something like this. So I'll zoom in here on the face. We'll select this. I'll go to my uh, graphic styles and I pick a size. This is 0.75, one point. I'm probably going to start off with a uh, five point here. Make sure we're on the correct layer. And then I'll just start building. Wherever your art comes a point, gets a point. Now, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, so uh, we've heard a lot of Bigfoot stories. I think I'm going to shrink this down to 0.25. Yeah, that's better. You just see the drawing underneath better like that. And uh, heard all kinds of Bigfoot stories. The Bigfoot lore kind of started in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so that's why I've always uh, enjoyed Bigfoot stories. I think they're, they're fun. And I'm using an astute plugin here. And I tend to do that if I'm doing curves like this. I just find it easier than using the pen tool. Like that. Once I get to a section that, you know, I, I don't use it on, I switch back to the pen tool, which is just a push of the P key. Um, it's kind of interesting in the Pacific Northwest, though. That's where I grew up. I was, I was born in Seattle and then um, uh, lived in the capital, which is Olympia. Uh, we always heard all those Bigfoot stories growing up. And actually, you're going to see another thing. Well, you've all, by the time you see this, you've already seen it on People Love. Um, it, it's another reason why I like growing up there is another crazy story I just heard of recently, and I turned that into a, a design, which was a lot of fun. Bat squats. Uh, one interesting thing about the Pacific Northwest, though, is it also is where the whole UFO lore, since that's kind of heating up, kind of weird with the government doing meetings and such. And by the way, you don't need to use this plugin. Like on this, here, this is what I'll do. I'm just going to zoom in. I think we're zoomed out too far here. If you don't have a plugin, don't worry about it. Just go wherever it comes to point, gets a point. Just focus on the points like that, then you know you're going to need a curve here, so we'll put one right about here, like that. It comes down here, this is going to get a curve, then it'll go into this point, pull that back a little bit, then again, switch the pin tool wherever it comes point gets a point. So if you don't have a plug-in, don't worry about it, just do it the way I'm showing you right now. Um, then you can go back with the anchor point tool, grab a straight, and just bend it, that's what this tool does. Just gonna finesse this curve to get a nice angle there. Anchor point tool to bend this, then you bend this. I just don't bend it too much. I'll then grab uh, the bezier handles that are revealed after you bend it, and then you can dial it in specifically using those. It just works better. Like this one doesn't have one. Now that it's here, then I'll pull this out. This one, just pull it out just so you get access to that handle. Then you can finesse it. This is a smart or a smooth anchor point. There's only two types of anchor points in Illustrator, smooth and corner. This is a smooth one that's right at the top or right at the side here of this shape. And these are considered corner anchor points. So as long as you can understand that, you should be able to build anything you need. So that's that shape. I think that's going to work good. And then I'm going to go back here. Oops. Every software has bugs. Even Astute has a few wigged out bugs like this one. It's not supposed to be doing that. It's supposed to be this arches tool. I need to talk to them about that. So if we go here, I select this one. This is point, like you can create a circle like that. I'm just doing that because all I want is the arch. 
and this is what it should do. But sometimes that other thing kicks in for some reason. Not sure why. Okay. But for the most part, I love Astute plugins. They just, man, they make life so much easier. Make the process go faster. Okay, we're going to focus on this area because this is going to be critical to create this and this because we'll offset it from that shape. So again, this is where um, I'm not going to apologize for using plugins because the reason why I use them is it just makes the process go faster. I realize not everybody is going to have a plugin, but just realize what I'm showing you. You can do natively. It's just going to take a little longer because you don't have a plugin. So you'll just have to use the pin tool and the anchor point tool to bend things. Like I'll do this and even the plugin doesn't get the exact curve. So I'll just remove that and then I'll just focus on using the Bezier curves to get what I want because it's easier than trying to monkey around with an extra anchor. Then I'll go back to this plugin, start where I left off, go here, get that curve, click here to here to get that curve, switch back to the pin, go here, this one probably, I might move it, we'll see. That, wherever it comes to a point, gets a point. Don't worry about trying to build this along this path. That can be a separate shape. And then we'll put it over here. So if you just build that way using the pin tool, then you can come back, grab the anchor point tool, pull on a path. That'll give you access to the handles. And then you can finesse uh, your curve. So once again, we have no handle here. So just grab the path, bend it a little. You get access to the handle. Then you can grab the handle and finesse the final shape. So you can see this, I'm going to pull this out just to get this handle. I think that looks better. And then you can adjust. Now this is when you break one. All you have to do is select it, go up here and go smooth on the control panel. Make sure you have the control panel turned on. That's where you do it under Windows. But with this anchor point selected, I'll just go smooth. It corrects that. It might mess up part of your art, so you'll have to make sure to adjust it after you do that, but that's how you correct a broken anchor. And then on something like this, this is where I'll just use the Bezier handles to make this little side area of his mouth, like that. And we'll just keep building. Uh, at some point, I really want to make these a live thing because I think this would be fun where as I'm working you could ask me whatever and then I could just you know it kind of give me something to talk to right now you're the victim of whatever my train of thought is at the moment so uh, hopefully I'll get too far down the rabbit trail on some of my stories like that now this is a long, long path to try to get it with um, a plugin. The plugin won't even do it. So this is where I'll do a smart remove. So it retains pretty much the same shape. Then I'll go back in and just finesse with these Bezier curves to get the exact curve I want there. I think that looks pretty good. Then we'll go here and close out the shape. So all that just to get that area of, of this. Now his tooth, super easy to build that and it's easier to build it as a separate shape where if it comes to a point, gets a point like that. Give it a little bend. I wouldn't make these perfectly straight because uh, nothing other than manufactured equipment and stuff like that is straight. These are all organic based life forms, so they tend to not be absolutely symmetric, absolutely perfect. So like that. And then I'll go ahead and punch it through this shape. So on this one, this shape is sitting on top. So if we fill this, you can see it's sitting on top. So I just select this 
and I'd ultimately um, go to Pathfinder down here. Let's pull that out up here, and I go minus front like that. But I'm not going to do that now. I just wanted to show you because I tend to build without doing that at this point in case I make uh, decide to do some differently. Uh, let's go ahead and build his nostrils here. Again, this put two extra anchors, so I'll smart remove it. Then I'll just go in and adjust it with my Bezier handles. By the way, Bezier, uh, that comes from a French scientist by the name of Pierre Bezier. He worked for Renault, which is a car company. And he didn't like the styling of the bodies. He thought they were too boxy. So he came up with the math for Bezier curves so they could do more elegant kind of shapes of automobiles. So that's kind of interesting history. So uh, what we use to create logos and icons uh, started off as a uh, basically industrial design of cars for Renault. I'm not so sure about that. Let me, I might tweak that a bit. Hmm. It looks a little kinky. Okay, I'm going to show you a feature. Uh, this is a plugin, uh, part of Vectorscribe. If I go here and notice, it's called Reposition Point Tool. And... Um, I might have told this story before. I can't remember. By the way, I'll repeat stories, I guarantee you, because I forget which ones I've told. Uh, years ago, I was at Max hanging out with Nick, who owns Astute Graphics. And I said, you know, it'd be really cool is at times if I could select an anchor point like this and just slide it onto the path and put it right where, it, where I think it would be a better location. And he goes, really? And I go, yeah. Two weeks later, they added this. So um, they call it the reposition point tool. I call it the Vaughn tool because uh, that was my idea. So that's kind of cool. And that's exactly how I use it. And I think that looks way better now than where I had it. So that's why I use it. Okay, so we have this mouth. Uh, all I want to do now is I want to offset this. So we'll go to object path and we'll go offset way too much. I don't know, what's three look like? Something like that. Maybe even, it's not bad over here. Actually, I'm going to keep it for there. But on this one, I think I'm going to do four. So we'll do it twice and we'll go four and see what that looks like. Well, maybe 3.5. Let's go 3.75. Boom. There we go. Make sure it's on top of the eye. I select that and I just go minus. Now I can go over to this side and all we're going to do is I'm going to, oh, see, it's doing it again. Okay, we'll just do it the old fashioned way with the pin tool. Click, click, click like that. Let's zoom in on this. Grab the anchor point tool. By the way, in the past, this tool didn't do this. They added this because of Astute's plugins. They basically took the same idea and instead of making it um, making it part of the pin tool, they put it onto this tool. I don't even remember what this tool was for before that, but. Uh, that's how you can bend your paths like that. Kind of molds it like if you think of clay, uh, turns vector objects into uh, a more moldable format. So if we bring this above, select this eye, minus front. Now we got that shape for his eye on that side. I think that looks good. And if I would have been paying attention, I would have realized I need it for this too. I wasn't, so we'll have to do that again. We'll go offset path. And I think on this one, it was three. And I want it to match this profile in the eyes. So I do want it to be three like that. And then we'll zoom in. This will be the detail on the cheek. And I'll create the cheek element here. And then switch back to the pin tool. 
that here, close out the shape. Um, if I'm using a vector scribe and I'm using the path scribe tool, notice when I hover over a path, it'll give me these white dots. Those are uh, called ghost handles. So I don't have to use the anchor point tool to expose a handle. I can just grab a ghost handle and pull it out as if the handle was there. So it's really, really intuitive, really useful. Um, and the reason why Astute makes such useful tools that are very intuitive and just just super smart the way they they implement them is because the the head developer for Astute was a designer. So he knows why it would work better having it this way. Um, believe it or not, Adobe does not have anybody like that on their development. They're just engineers who know how to code and do math. And uh, that's why some of the features they come up with are just, man, that's still doing it that way. Okay, we'll just again. Um, so they have engineers, smart engineers, they can code, but they don't know better when they do certain things in development. Like, why would you do it that way? That's, it's because none of them actually use Illustrator. And that, that's the most frustrating part. And I've talked to Adobe about this. They said, hey, how about this? All these things that you're struggling with to get done in Illustrator, you know, I even told them this back in 2019 when I went to, um, uh, they brought me to New Delhi to be part of an Adobe Summit. And they assigned engineers to us. And I told them why I was there. I go, hey, what about this? Hire me for four years. I'll work for you for four years. We'll lock down all the things in Illustrator that could be improved upon. And then you're gonna get all kinds of love from your user base because it's just dead solid dependable. And all these things like the snapping bug, let's fix that, let's fix, let's improve uh, the, the workflow method, this and that. And it's like, no, they weren't, they, they're, they're more concerned that I called out things that didn't work well on social media. And I'm going, you know, if I would have never called things out, you would have never invited me to summit. That's the only reason you know who I am. So, yeah, it's kind of frustrating, but what are you going to do? It is what it is. Okay. Um, we'll do the ear. So we have most of the face done. We're just going to do the ear. The rest of the body will be go pretty quick because it's just a profile pretty much. Um Here's one thing I'll do is like, I'm going to do this first. I'm going to establish that line like that. Switch to the pen tool. And this is where I'll just create a shape like this because I'm going to create the ear. We'll do that. Point comes to point, point comes to point. So this is the raw build. And that looks pretty wonky, right? Doesn't look that great at all well think in shapes so this is where the anchors only need to be then you can pull it into shape like this pull this one out that'll give you access to the handles and you can do the full ear the outside of the ear that is like that pull this out it gives you access to the handles pull these out like that same thing with this inner part of the ear pull out the handles pull out the handles no, we might reposition some of this. It's a process. But now I have that. I take this shape. Let's go ahead and fill it so you can see it's behind. We want to make sure that's on top. Then I'll select this shape. And then I'll minus front. So I wouldn't want to try to build that because you're never going to get this optically aligned to so your eye reads that edge. So that's how I build something like that. And again, I fluctuate from... The core tools in Illustrator to plugins whenever I think it's going to improve the process. This is where I'll go to the plugin to do these arches because this is like a lightning bolt, his fur here. And it's just easier doing it with a tool that can create these arches really simple like that. I don't have to touch Bezier curves. 
it just creates, oops, it just creates um, the Bezier curve automatically like that. And when I'm not talking, it goes even a little faster. Like that, we're almost done here. Boom, something like that. That looks pretty good. Let's do the top part of his head now. We'll use the same tool. I was showing an engineering friend of mine who does, he works for a company that does infrastructure design like bridges for towns and stuff. And he was watching me work in Vector and he's going, oh yeah, we, I go, because I know he uses CAD and that has some Vector aspects to it. And he said, oh yeah, we've had CAD tools in, um, Oh, I can't remember the industry standard for CAD. Oh, what did they call that? Uh, AutoCAD. He said, they've had tools like this for 20 years. I go, wow, really? Well, this is relatively new for <laughs> Toby Illustrator. Okay. When I start creating the the kind of the profile or the, the outside profile, the shape, such as his head, this is where I'll separate it into independent shapes. I'm not going to try to build it into the shoulder. Um, I want to just focus on the head. So this is where I'll just start creating the outside of the head. And again, I'm using that Arches plugin by Astute Graphics. It's part of Subscribe plugin. So, I mean, it's fundamentally changed the way um, I build my vector art. It's just, it, it's just nuts how easy it makes uh, creating shapes. And you would think, and I think the most frustrating part of vector building for most uh, creative people who, at least when they initially start, eventually you'll get used to it, is that it seems so laborious uh, using a pen tool to create things. So that's that's why you have a lot of people who will image trace because they're just trying to create what they want faster. And I think you sacrifice way too much quality when you do that. And ironically, I was the same way back in the early 90s when I started working in a small design studio. They were leasing Macintoshes. Um, it was the first time I started working digitally. And they were using Macromedia Freehand. And so uh, that's what I would do is I would ink out my artwork and I would image trace it. But then I found myself spending so much time um, like rebuilding the artwork or cleaning it up after it adds all these anchor points that I just told myself I need to learn just how to build stuff clean. So I'm not wasting all this time cleaning up after I image trace something. Back then they didn't even have image trace. It was, it was called um, Streamline. And they had actually bought it from a company out of Illinois uh, who developed it because I met a guy who uh, used to work for that company uh, two years ago at Creative South and delete that one. And he used to build all this vector art back in the day by hand. Uh, and they're the ones that developed that. And then Illustrator liked it, bought it, sold it as Streamline, and then they integrated it into Illustrator as Image Trace. Um, so that looks, that looks good. We got the head now. All we're going to do is let's focus on... We'll create his body or the, his uh, chest area here. Now, this is very circular, but I wouldn't try to build this. With, I'll, I'll build with shapes for his, like, what you, nipples uh, on Bigfoot nipples. I don't know if I've ever said that sentence in my entire life, Bigfoot nipples. But uh, we're going to be building it here live on People of Process. 
we're creating Bigfoot nipples. So there you go. But if you think as a clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, point gets a point, those are easy. Easy, easy. Don't worry about the curves. We'll come back with the anchor point tool and finesse those like that. We'll just focus on the points. Then we'll go back to curves. It's like six o'clock. We'll do a nine o'clock. Wherever it comes to a point, gets a point and close the shape. Uh, so this again, a rough build. Now let's go ahead and zoom in. We'll get in here and you can use the anchor point tool natively in the illustrator, grab the path. But this is why I don't like using this tool to do a lot of this kind of stuff. Notice when I do this, it's affecting the next anchor point and the other side of that anchor point, which is really stupid. I don't know why they designed it like that, where if I go to path scribe, I can just focus on this ghost handle, pull it out and notice it stays within the segment I'm on. It doesn't wig out the artwork on the other side in the other segment, which I don't know. Their plugin figured this out, but Adobe's own engineers still don't. They Once again, if they had to build what I'm building here, they go, crap, we should really fix that because that's annoying, but they don't. So they don't ever think about fixing stuff like that because they don't use it. That's at least the way, that's the only justification I can think of that they have is they're just ignorant. So, so all we're doing now is grabbing these paths and bending them. And you can do that using the anchor point tool. So if we just bend this one and notice it doesn't affect it when it's a corner, it's only when it's a smart or a smooth anchor like it was on the front part of his chest. So we can grab this like this using the anchor point tool and we can grab this path and bend it. And then if you need to finesse it with the handles, there we go. Now, even though I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, I've never seen Bigfoot. I've actually met a few people who said they have, but I don't know. How do I put it? They seemed a few fries short of a Happy Meal. So <laughs> I like the lore. I don't know if I completely buy it, though. I think somebody would have uh, caught one by now. Who knows, though? Maybe they're just like those T-shirts say, the world champion hide-and-seek is Bigfoot, <laughs> which is a brilliant T-shirt. Okay, there we go. So I think we got his chest done. Let's go ahead and create these elements. Once again, ellipse tool, rotate them into place. Something like that. Yes, I'm too lazy to actually go grab the ellipse tool and rebuild it. So I'm just gonna scale this one down. That's fine. Then this shape, we can start with the ellipse. Like that. Then I'll create a clone, go a little bigger. Command C, Command F, by the way. I have it set up as an F3 key. So if I select some, just go F3. What that does, creates a clone. Um, it does a command C, copy, command F, paste. And I also have a bring to front, which is object, arrange, bring to front. So it's all those three commands are assigned to the F3 key. Uh, just because it makes the process, oh, we moved up here. There we go, Pathfinder. So we have his belly button now. And all we have to do is the rest. So um, we'll see how long this takes. I don't want these movies to be too long, but, and I knew this one would be, we're just going to stick with illustrator specific methods 
try not to use any plugins unless obviously it's going to improve the art if we do because I don't want you guys to think well I can't do that because I don't have a plugin that's not true you can do everything I'm showing you natively in Illustrator it's just going to take you a little longer and we'll go here once again I'm focusing on the points not the curves at this point and I don't care about the curves going up here comes to a point here boom gets one gets one we'll go back and finesse all of that and we'll go up here so this would be his arm and I'm just going to close out this shape because this is how I build where I focus on one element in this case the arm then I'll go to the anchor point tool and then we can finesse this curve that goes up here this one bends down pull this one up a little further and this is where you might want to zoom in even further right now like that we'll go back to the anchor point tool grab that one this one's going to go down this one's going to go up this is straight we don't want that so we want to add a little bend there a little bend there like this and this is where I have smart guides turned on. So it goes like this. And if you get too close, it wants to snap to a path. So if it gets in your way, just turn off smart guides. Command U to turn it on and off. Like that. And anchor point tool to bend this curve. Bend that one. And by the way, to move the screen around, if I hold the shift key, it's the hand. So that's how I move it as I'm creating. Move it down. So you can see this isn't hard. You don't want to you don't want to rush it does no good to to use a precise build method like vector and then rush it and then you're it just looks sloppy when you're done take your time um, my daughter man she's so much faster at building vector art than I am there we go so we have most of uh, well we have all the arm profile just not the hand done that looks good now I could try to well I'll just show you and explain why I don't do this um, I could select this go to object go to path go to offset path and go well let's go minus seven like this to get this and you can see it just looks clunky so I never do that because I don't think it ever looks that great so this is where again I'll just focus on just building it manually so we'll go like this, wherever it comes a point, gets a point, like this. Then we'll go to the anchor point tool. Oop. And I'll finesse these Bezier curves, grab the paths, finesse those, grab this, add a little bend to it. You know, there's some that say the Pacific Northwest, since it it was the founding area for UFOs back in the day, Bigfoot. Um, we also have the, the Green Mermaid. That'd be Starbucks. Not really part of the lore, but um, a lot of people have called it the paranormal Northwest. There's actually, I, I live in Oregon, which is the, uh, the state, and then the capital is Salem. Um, there's a town just north of us called McMinnville, 
and that's the area where the original UFO sighting was back in the day. And um, this is a good example of turning off smart guides so I can do a subtle without it snapping. And so they have a UFO festival there every year and they have a parade. And I mean, if you want to see like the lunatic fringe, <laughs> go, to, go to that event. It's kind of fun. If you like people watching, which I kind of do, um, uh, you see a lot of interesting people there. It's kind of, we went one year and it wasn't a disappointment. It was like, holy cow, look at that over there. It's kind of fun. Uh, you got a lot of uh, cosplay people show up who are dressed like Klingons or Star Trek characters. It was all over the place. It was kind of uh, is kind of interesting. I've always wanted to go to a Star Trek convention. I never have, because I don't want to like going to a convention like that and going by yourself is like going to a movie by yourself. You feel like a loser. It's like. If if I'm going to go to an event like that, I want to go with somebody else who's going to be just as much a geek as I do. Now, I wouldn't dress up, but I think it would be fun to go there just to see all the cool costumes and uh, some of the, uh, you know, actors who show up who play the roles that I enjoy on Star Trek, especially DS9. I, I like Deep Space Nine best of all the series. Um it's just a lot of fun. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Someday, maybe. Can't get my wife on board with it. There's no way. She just looks at me like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like, so that's not going to happen. But maybe someday. Uh, years ago, my friend Dickie called me up and he said, hey, what would you think? And at the time I was playing Minecraft with my daughters, I had gotten them a server that, for themselves and invited our cousins to come on it to play Minecraft with my daughters. And it was kind of fun. And then I learned how to play, how to use Minecraft. And I would always go in and sabotage uh, Savannah's um, areas and hide dynamite under the ground so she'd start digging and it'd blow everything, <laughs> blow everything up. Uh, so I was just seeing how far I could push like the platform to see if, uh, you know, like how deep I could dig, that kind of stuff. It was kind of fun. But anyway, uh, my friend Dickie calls me up and says, hey, uh, they're gonna have a Minecraft convention. Do you want to go to Minecraft? And I go, I I Minecraft one or I think that's what it was called is in Las Vegas. And I go, sure. I have nothing to do next weekend. So, uh, me and him flew down to, um, Las Vegas and we we're checking in. Well, Dickie's into board games big time and he's, uh, an enforcer at PAX. And I, I'm just telling you what it is. I don't know what enforcer means, but apparently it's like somebody who helps, them run the conference and deal with issues when they come up, that kind of stuff. So we're checking in. He's wearing his enforcer badge from PAX. And the person behind the checkout counter for Minecon goes, you're an enforcer? He goes, yeah. And he goes, and he like lifts up his lapel. It's almost like a secret society right in front of me. And they're showing each other their enforcer badge. And then it's like, <laughs> you know, then it's like, well, how you doing? You know, and, and he goes, hey, we need help with this confer conference. Would you two be willing to be like the chaperones for uh, some of our guest speakers? And we're going, well, what does that entail? Well, you get behind the stage passes and and you get to hang out with uh, the, the speakers. And I go, well, who's, you know, my friend Dickie goes, who's the speakers? Well, it's it's uh, these these people called Yogcast. I didn't have a clue who they were. I had no idea. Uh, so I'm texting my daughter, Alyssa, who's totally in, well, she still plays uh, mine, uh, Minecraft. And I go, okay, Alyssa, have you heard of Yogcast? And she goes, holy cow, they're there? And I go, yeah. And I go, we're, we're their chaperones for the weekend. And she's going, what? And she's like, want me to get their autograph and stuff. And I don't know. It was it was a it was a different event. It was kind of a 
is interesting. And then they had a special guest for a music event that was held at the Wynn Casino. And this just shows me my ignorance when it comes to music. The guy is DJ Mouse or Mouse or I can't remember. I'm, some of you are going, no, it's not. That's not how you call it. it it's a mouse and he's a DJ and he plays music and uh, you basically dance to it, that kind of stuff. And and so I go, yeah, I guess I'll go. You know, I, I don't really get into that kind of stuff, but whatever. We'll, I'll experience it. I go, they wouldn't let me in because I didn't meet the Win Casino's dress code. I was wearing shorts and for some reason... It's like pants only. I'm going, seriously? I just walked all the way across town and now, you know, I'm not, I go, okay, forget it. So I just go back to our hotel that we were staying at and uh, played penny slots for the rest of the night. I don't know why I'm telling this story. Anyway, that's a rabbit trail. So Minecon, there you go. Um, Minecraft. Well, Minecraft and then I think it was called Minecon 1. I'm sure they've had other since then they've sold it they've sold minecraft to um uh microsoft okay that hand will work and by the way whenever i do that if i select this and i go unite it'll get rid of that inside shape but again i'm just focusing on building and once i get these build all let's see i'll set it to 0.5 so we can see it a little better that works um, we're going to keep building. Um, I think this is going a little long. So, uh, what I might do is I'm going to build this arm and I'm going to give myself like 20 more minutes to build this. If I can do that, great. If not, um, then I'm going to stop recording where I'm at and then I will come back once I have all this base built and then we'll go from that point. Uh, but, you know, this is where a live format, I think, might work a little better because uh, you guys could be asking me whatever you want to ask why, why I'm working. Let's go ahead and build this arm. I'll tell you a story about one of my teachers in art school. Uh, he is one of my design teachers, Fred Griffin. Fred came up with his own design code, a method for teaching graphic design. Uh, his last name was Griffin, so it was called the Griffin Design Code. Um, I knew nothing about design when I started art school. Um, I just thought the way he taught, that's how design's taught. I didn't realize till years later that it's, um, that it's his own proprietary method for teaching design. And a lot of really great designers out of the Seattle area, uh, went to that school and went through that program. And, um, it was kind of interesting. Well, Fred was very eccentric. Like, he would talk like this, and he he kind of looked like a pilgrim. He had that kind of pilgrim's beard, no mustache, but the beard part. And then um, he would wear a fishing vest to class. And in the fishing vest would be art supplies. And so he could pull out a sketch pad or pins or Conte crayons and tape and tracing paper and on-the-spot uh, be able to do something. Now, keep in mind, this is all pre-digital, so nothing was digital at that point. Eventually, that school moved into digital, and he acclimated to that as well, but at the time, I was learning everything traditionally, but he would teach us all these methods uh, for all these principles. One of them is called contour continuation. I've mentioned that a few times in some of my movies, and uh, that's one of his principles is uh, you want contour continuation. It helps retain the continuity of a design and pulls things together and guides the viewer's eye, so on and so forth. Uh, and it was a pretty cool system. But Fred was unique. He was also a fine artist. So he did these resin paintings 
And as another teacher told us one time, Fred's the way he is because his studio for the longest time didn't have, <laughs> didn't have good ventilation. <laughs> so basically all of these uh, uh, fumes from uh, the paints and solvents he's using, he took them in too much. That that was the excuse we got from uh, uh, Bill Cummings, another teacher in art school. Uh, well, Fred would just kind of go off on stuff at times. And so, actually, I'm going to take this and offset it, see if I can get what I need. I'll go offset. Uh, 7.5, so that looks like, oh, perfect. There we go. I don't have to build that part of the chest. That's done now. So that is a case that saved me time. Anyway, Fred would go off on strange stuff, just like tell us stories. Like Fred, um, he'd go, I like to put tra uh, tape tracing paper to the wall and then... I will trace shadows from the tree in our front yard and make things from it. And we're just, you know, when, like, I was barely 19 at that point. That's when you're looking at other people in the class and you're just going, okay, this guy's a little crazy, you know? <laughs> and, and I didn't really appreciate how eccentric he was. It wasn't until years later that I kind of realized, wow, well, it sounded crazy at the time, but it's actually kind of cool, some of the stuff he did. Well, one day, this shows you how extreme he was. He came into class, and one of his arms is in a cast. And we go, Fred, what would you do to your arm? I was doing texture rubbings on my roof, and I, <laughs> I fell off. We just started laughing. And, and so because he is so eccentric, a friend of mine, Jim, at the time, rap music was just coming on the scene. So my friend Jim was into rap music, and he decided to create a rap for uh, Fred Griffin. <laughs> and it was kind of funny. Because he would just mention weird things, like showing a design, this negative space looks like this. And so Jim came up with these lyrics that went, the negative space, it, like he had a whole song. I can only remember one part of the song, the lyrics, because it, it always cracked me up. Um, the negative space is kind of murky. If I stare too long, it becomes a turkey. And then he mimicked Fred because one day in class we were doing um, a magazine cover and it was supposed to be Thanksgiving theme. And he's explaining something. And then the next second he's going gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> and so Jim comes up with, he works out into these lyrics for his Fred Griffin rap song that, uh, uh, the negative space is kind of murky. If I stare too long, it becomes a turkey. Gobble, gobble, gobble. I don't know. It's just, is we had so much fun in art school. It was just every every day, especially in that class, we were always laughing because people were always uh, joking around because of the the way Fred acted, it was just kind of crazy at times. Um, let's see. No other reason telling you that story than uh, that's kind of what we went through in art school. The other teacher, Bill Cummings, was pretty, he was, wow, when I was in art school, he was in his 70s. Uh, white, eagle white hair, but he'd wear leg warmers, and he'd always be dating somebody like in their 30s, something like that. Something like that. Uh, I watched, uh, he, we had him for illustration class. We had him for lettering class. And one day in lettering class, I was done with the assignment. And I go up by the front of the room and I'm watching him do these sketches. And he's going through his sketchbook. He has a sketchbook open, a sheet, of, a pad of paper or um, a stack of paper. And he's just redrawing his sketches, signing them flipping him over, going to another page in his book, and he's just redrawing these sketches in his sketchbook. And I'm going, Fred, what are you doing? And he's going, um, well, and he talked like this. And he go, well, I got a gallery opening on Thursday. This was Monday. Um, and I need to get these sketches done for it. Well, I watch him do about 10 in 
I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And then uh, after I watch him, I go, I just ask him. I probably wouldn't even do that now. I would. I didn't even think about it back then. I I go, hey, could could I have one of those sketches? And and he goes, sure, Robert. And that was the other thing is is our names in the grade books. It had our our middle name first, our last name second, and then our first name last. I don't know why, but that's how the teachers' grade books were. And so, uh. Bill thought that everybody's first name was their middle name. So he called me Robert, like for the whole two years I went to art school and I never corrected him because I just thought it was kind of funny, but he gave me one of those sketches and I still have that sketch today in my flat file. But later that week on Thursday, me and two friends, we went to the gallery opening of his and that's where we found out that Bill was really well known for his artwork in the Pacific Northwest. He had paintings there sold for 60,000, 45,000. Every one of those sketches that I watched him draw within 30 minutes in class that day were in a plastic sleeve on a wall right as you enter the gallery. Each one of them sold for 500 bucks. I mean, I was just like, okay, that's a different level of uh of artwork and creating art bill cummings um i went back to art school to speak at fred griffin's class actually and anita griffin his wife who teaches there i'm still in contact with anita um and bill was still teaching he's in his 90s and it was about, I'd say, five years after that that uh, Bill finally passed away. But talk about an interesting character. He knew all kinds of people, too. I remember in illustration class one time, he was telling us a story about him and Joe DiMaggio going bar hopping in New York City. And we're like, what? It's just like, he just... And then some days... He'd get off on a tangent and he'd just start talking about quantum physics for the whole period instead of like teaching illustration or anything. And I had no idea what quantum physics was. I was going, why is he doing this? It wasn't until years later that I I started reading up on physics and learned what like quantum physics was and the string theory. And I go, okay, well, that is kind of cool. Uh, but it was, just, it was just a trip. Art school was a trip. And if you've ever seen the movie Art School Confidential, if you haven't seen the movie Art School Confidential, uh, you should watch it. That really f is kind of what art school for me felt like. It was kind of crazy. It was, it was fun, though. A fun kind of crazy. Okay. Let me finesse this. I went to art school in Seattle, so Seattle Art Institute. Well, when it started, it was the Burnley School of Art, and then they got bought out by the Art Institutes, and over the next two years, they transitioned to the Art Institutes of America, and it became Seattle Art Institute. I think that's looking okay. This, I might make adjustments as I go to black and white. We'll see. Oh, that looks better. So I kind of obsess over these type of details. This doesn't look good. Let's fix that. There we go. Now, you once again, you could try to, well, let's just do that and see what it looks like. I don't think it's going to look good at all, but we'll go here. We'll go to object path and we'll go offset. See what that looks like. That's not horrible. Let's see. Maybe we can put 
bring this down like this. And this is where you have to zoom in I'm way too far out. I don't even know if it's worth trying to finesse these things like this. I don't know if it's going to save us any time. Smart remove that one. Actually, I'm going to smart remove. And this is one feature Illustrator doesn't have, and they have it on the iPad version, so they should bring it to the desktop smart remove. Because I want to be able to smart remove these without destroying the path, and that way I can edit it faster to get that curve I want. Like on this one. I think this would make more sense being up like that. We'll do that. And then that looks better. We don't need that one. We'll just get rid of that. And then again, this is... I'm going to go like this and smart remove it because it'll be easier to control with those two Bezier curves. This. Get rid of that. So that'll, I guess this will work. I usually never do it this way, but I figured I might as well try. I get rid of that one because we can control it better with just the Bezier handles. Okay, get rid of that, get rid of that, smart remove it. By the way, smart remove is part of Vector Scribe plugin. It's been around for a decade now. Illustrator still doesn't have it. They have it on the iPad, but for whatever reason, I don't know. They don't think people need it on the desktop, which is nuts. A lot of times Illustrator makes decisions because they have a team at, Illust at Adobe called the Monetary Marketing Team. And they decide what features to retain, what features to kill off. Why? Because it makes the creative process uh, easier? No, they, they do that because it'll force people to use other things that Adobe creates. And uh, that's just wrong headed in my opinion. Yeah, I think that'll, that'll work. That'll, that'll work for his hand. So what I'm going to do, um, I don't want to be laborious over the same methodology, but the same principles I used on the head, the two arms, uh, the front chest, and specifically on um, all the inner detail and stuff. You saw how I created it. I'm going to use the exact same methods to work out the rest of his torso, his legs, and his feet. And then we'll come back and then we'll go from that base art at that point. And then I'll show you how I color it and do all that detailing next. Okay, I now have all the base vector artwork done from the time I uh, kind of stopped recording to now picking it up again. Uh, approximately 28 min minutes went by to create the other elements, uh, to create the entirety of the base vector artwork. It's at this point, um, I like saving things as I go, and I usually save the base vector artwork. I'll just select everything, and I'm just going to go uh, Command-C, Command-F, make a copy of it, and then I drag it to my X layer and I kind of store it there. This becomes kind of my vector junk drawer. I might group it just so they all stay together like that. Uh, but I like doing that so I can always go back. At times, I'll also, if I want to keep this layer intact, then I'll just make a duplicate of the build layer. And this will be the base art like that. 
And all this, we're just going to select all these independent shapes that make up uh, the outline, in that case, his hand, his feet, this part of the foot. All the elements we can unite with Pathfinder together, I'll select now. All these. And just that, actually. Let's go ahead and take this. Copy. Because I'm going to use that to trim this inside part of the hand, like that since we built it with two flat shapes, but we'll take these two shapes, the head, the chest, the leg, the bottom part of the feet, this leg, the back, and the hand here, all these, and we'll just go Unite. We'll go ahead and fill it with a blue, just so you can see what it's doing. You can see we have these interior shapes we don't need. So I'll click into that, get rid of that, all these shapes, we're going to go down to Compound Release. And we'll turn everything back into an outline like that. I'll go ahead and send these to the back. Send this all the way to the back. So now if we color this, let's color this blue. You can see all of our shapes are sitting on top. So that's kind of what we want but we don't want it blue at this point. I'm going to go into here. I'm going to select the elements that make up the face like this. Now we'll take this shape that we created for the tooth. I'll go minus front. That way we have the independent shape. This, bring it forward. We're going to punch that through using minus front. We'll select this cheek. We'll select the top. All these will make up the face. And I'll unite all those like that. So if we go to appearance, it's a compound. That's fine. We can even color the eyes the same. So we'll unite those, turn that into a compound. Tooth we don't need to do. We'll select these feet and the hands. All those will unite together. We'll select the two nipples in his belly button. If I fill it with the red, unite those. Bring them to the front, select this, minus. So now we have the chest ready to go. Everything else is going to be the interior shapes. We can actually fuse these two together. Let's unite those like that. So let's start focusing on color. Now we know Bigfoot in general, when people think of Bigfoot and they go, what color is Bigfoot? Well, if he's a Yeti, which would be the kissing cousin of Bigfoot, he'd be white furred, you know, hanging out in the Arctic, wherever, snow areas. Uh, but Bigfoot's more considered a primate that hangs out in forested areas, and his color is like a brown. So we'll pick, we'll use a darker brown, maybe a little lighter, like that. Then I'll take the areas that are going to be the face. We'll use this tan color. And by the way, all these swatches I have in here... Uh, part of my new document setup, if I go command N, and I like using the old interface, um, I have my own setting for uh, GS Print Glitch Studios. If I select that and we'll go with a horizontal and I go, OK, notice my new document always has those colors in it. Those are proven colors that I've used over the years. And uh, so I like doing that. That way it gives me a starting point and I'll finesse color if I want to. We'll select the hands and the feet. We'll use that same kind of base color. I'm going to use all the elements within the fur area. If we sample the base art, because we're using global colors, note the denote the, um, uh, the white triangle in the bottom right. We go here. And if we just adjust this to, I don't know, let's try... 65 you know you can see the coloring coming in there 
we might change these colors. We'll just set them to begin with and then adjust the values if we need to. This one and the back of his arm. We can sample the one we already have. So you can see this is going pretty quick. Now, I like Bigfoot being kind of aggressive. So I think on his eyes, we need to make those kind of, I don't know, a yellow. So he's more intense. We could even make him red. Oop, not the outline, but the interior. Like, I think I like orange. I think it goes better with um, the brown. We'll take this. We gave him a snaggle tooth. I think that looks pretty good. Now, if our light source, and this is where you're working on shading, and I might stop recording for this because it's at this point I'll print out a black and white of what you see here, and then I'll actually draw on it to figure out the shading because I do that in analog. So this is where... Uh, screen recording can't capture everything. So I might do that. Let me let me adjust some of these values. Um, I'm thinking the light source is going to be coming from the right since we have this highlight and there's nothing on the back. So I want this highlight. Right now we have it set for, what did I use there? Oh, go on. There we go. 65. So I think the ones to the back part of his face, I think these should be darker. So let's go to 80, like that. And I think that looks better. So we'll translate all these ones further away from the light source. We'll make those 80 as well. Yeah, I think that adds a lot. I think that looks nice. Um, I'm not sure about this. I'm wondering maybe... Nah, that looks weird to have it that color. Okay, um, I think that looks good. So what I'm going to do again is I'm going to uh, go ahead and I'm going to stop recording here so that I can print this out. It only takes me a few minutes to draw out the shading, but it's a lot faster and more efficient than trying to do it uh, in Adobe Illustrator. But what I do is I don't want to print out the color art. So this is usually where I'll go duplicate uh, this layer and I'll select all the shapes minus the background perimeter shape and all of these again we're just going to color white and I'll do this and I'll color black because I'm going to print this out now and draw on top of it and we'll come back and I'll let you know how much time now we spent about 10 minutes so we're going to come back after I have my drawn sketch done Okay, so a few minutes have gone by. Actually, something came up as I was uh, drawing this out, and um, I had to go do something, and then I came back. So approximately the total time that I spent on drawing out the shading, and this is what I printed out, and then this is uh, the drawing that I did on top of it. Now, this only took maybe... I don't know, three minutes total to kind of figure this out. Once you get in the habit of doing it, I've been doing this for 20 years now, printing stuff out and drawing on top of it. Actually, longer than that, considering my freehand days. Uh, but this just is a lot faster and more efficient with your time uh, than trying to noodle around in Illustrator. This defines the shading I want to add to this character. Uh, so I'll just take this. Uh, this is just a TIFF image. Once again, I used a flatbed scanner to scan it in, align it with my uh, base art that's underneath it. If I turn this off, you know, you can see how it aligns with that. And with this selected, I'll just set it to around 30% like this, just so I can see it on top of my base art. So with that layer lock, though, my base art is still uh, selectable. And if I interact with it, my smart guides will snap to paths, snap to anchors. And then just like my base art, I build all the shapes on top of it. So these are all the vector shapes. So the total amount of time, maybe 15, 20 minutes um, uh, to build everything. So not a long time. Once again, you want to take your time to do it well. 
And uh, all I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to turn off my black and white art and turn on my color art because, uh, one, it's easier to see, and two, we're going to be uh, coloring stuff. And so I have two types of shapes here. I have shapes for the shading, so this is going to make up the shading of the face here. And I have these shapes that make up highlights that we're going to do. So what I'm going to do is just select um, the shapes of the face. I'm going to make a copy of it. Command C, Command F. So if I just move it, you can see I've just copied it. Now that's still sitting on this layer, that's fine. We're gonna select the shading now with that face shape selected, and I'm gonna to go to Pathfinder, and we're gonna use Intersect, meaning wherever they overlap, we'll create a new shape. I'll hit that, and now you can see how it's created that shape. Now this will just default to a group, so I always turn it into a compound path. Um, I have a keyboard shortcut set up to do that. If you don't, just go to Compound Make. Notice I can just hit F7, so I never go there and do that. So we'll just let it stay on this layer so it doesn't go to the colored layer. Um, these, uh, we'll select the eyes. I'll clone these, Command-C, Command-F, select the eye shapes. Again, we'll go to Pathfinder. We'll just bring Pathfinder out here so we don't have to always go back. And we'll go Intersect on that. We'll select this shape, clone it, Command-C, Command-F, intersect with that. So now we have the detail on the eyes. And now we're going to do all the highlighting uh, that's going to be on um, the face. And what, one thing I will point out, and um, I'll go ahead, actually, I'll go ahead and focus on that now. Let me turn off the shade. I noticed that I kind of goofed up on one part. And that was on his nose. I intended this to be circular. And so when I went to uh, figure out the shade, well, it looks like I got an extra anchor point there. So I'll just go ahead and delete that. We don't need that. Uh, when I was uh, building the shape that's going to end up being the highlight, I noticed, oh, I goofed up on the nose. It shouldn't really be that way. Uh, so I'm going to fix that. And I do this all the time when I'm working where I hyper focus on one thing and kind of uh, lose track of another element. So let's just select this shape and I'm going to just put it thinner so it's easier to see. I'm going to make a copy, Command C, Command F, and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to make a throwaway shape like this because I'm just going to use that to create a piece. So I'm going to intersect these two to give me this. Then I'll go ahead and color it the same color as the base art. I'll move it to the base art color. I'm going to turn off my detail layer. So if I select all the elements in the face, you can see it's a compound. That's fine. We're going to unite this with this using uh, Pathfinder. And notice it's going to revert to a group every time you use that. And so that's why I have a keyboard shortcut set up for F7, so I can always turn it back to compound. So those are the kind of things you're going to notice. You're going to make mistakes like that. It's no big deal as long as you fix it. And so now it's going to it's going to work fine. We're going to take uh, these highlight shapes on the face. Actually, let's zoom out a little farther. We're a bit too close. Uh, we're going to take those shapes. You can see all those. Let's fill it with blue so you can see which ones I'm talking about. And I'm going to select the face, make a clone of it, Command-C, Command-F, select the blue shapes, intersect it, fix uh, the group back into a compound. That's fine. We don't need the blue anymore. We'll just hide that. We're going to be coloring it a specific color. We'll select the tooth, we'll make a copy of it, select the shape, there'll be the shading on the tooth, intersect it, and we have all that. So everything for the face um, is already done. So if I just select all of these elements of the face and I just go blue, get rid of the outline, that'll just denote that all those are done. Turn this back on. So we'll go back and recolor those shapes. All I'm going to do now is uh, the same shapes that I created based off my shading for the chest. We'll do those. So we'll take this, take a copy of the chest, Command-C, Command-F, select the shading shapes, intersect them. That gives us everything there. We'll take another 
Um, we'll take another copy of the chest shape, Command-C, Command-F, and we'll create this, which will be a highlight. And we'll do this highlight here with a copy of the chest, like that. Again, I can select all of these elements. And just so we denote that they're done, we'll color them blue. And the hand, I'll make a copy of these, select this, go intersect. Again, we'll color it blue temporarily. And we'll take this on the feet, this on the feet. We'll go ahead and unite those. Then we'll take a copy, Command-C, Command-F, select these feet. We'll go intersect. We'll color those blue. This ultimately will be a highlight, but we'll color blue. And then the last part is this hand. We'll make a copy, select that, intersect, and we'll color blue. So now we have all the elements we have to color now. So let's go ahead and all the coloring that's going to be on the face for the shading, for the chest, for the hands, for the feet, and for this hand, these are all going to be the same. So with all those selected, we're going to go Unite. Make sure it's a compound path. Right now, we were using this for the base color. I have this hue that I use for shading for that color. And we'll just click there and you can see the shading it's added. If you think it should be more, what we can do is make a shading value of the chest instead. So with the base color selected, I'll go here. We're going to create a new color. So this base color is just 3% red, 25 yellow, 25 black. So to make a shading hue that's going to work for it, we cut this in half. So half of 25 would be about uh, 12 and a half. So we'll just go to 13. That's fine. Um, I'll go ahead and leave the, um, uh, leave the 3% in it. And actually, I'm going to bring this down to 10 like that. And now with that color, let's add that color in as a shading add it to global, turn it to global, that is. And then we'll make sure it's colored that. And if we go to transparent, we'll set a, a blend mode to multiply. Oh, oops, I goofed up. I colored the wrong thing. I thought I had my shading selected. Let's recolor that. I want the shading to be colored that. So we'll color the shading like that. Then we'll go down to transparency and we'll go to multiply. And I think that's a little good, but a little dark. So let's go 70, see what that looks like, 70%. I think that looks good. So that works. Let's zoom in on the face. So you can see the, how the shading is coming out on the face. I'm going to select all the highlights, and we'll unite those together. We're just going to color it the base color. Then we're going to go to the color palette, and we're going to tint that to 50% value of the base color to get those highlights. Then on the, the colors of the eyes, we're using this color and we'll use the color right next to it as the shadowing. We could even um, unite that if we want to. And we might even go multiply to get it a little darker. I think that looks good. And then if you want to adjust the value, maybe it's 80% instead of 100, like that. That looks good. The blue's not bad, but it's a little too dark. I want it to be lighter. So we'll change it, I think more muted too. We'll change it to that value. I think that looks good. So you can see how his face is looking. We'll go down here on these highlights. We'll just apply the same tint that we used in the face, like that. And we'll go down, and the hands have the same shading, the feet have the same shading, and we'll select this, and we'll sample the highlight there. And I think we have our character done. So this is with all the detailing in it, detailing shapes. So if I go ahead and turn off the detailing shapes, this is flat, doesn't look bad, but it looks a whole lot uh, cooler um with the shading now now the more i look at this this color seems a little too black i think it needs to be richer so i'm going to add more red into it 
maybe just a little more black or a little more yellow. Let's see what that looks like. Preview it before. I think that looks better. So we'll go with that. So that's how I create this character. I'm probably going to add some type to it. Not sure what I'll use it for, but now I have artwork that I didn't have previously. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully my stories weren't too annoying and <laughs> they're somewhat entertaining. Um, that's why I look forward to eventually making this uh, series uh, a live stream because interacting with the audience is what's really going to uh, make it a lot of fun, I think. So um, I've wanted to reapproach this sketch for over a year now, and this gave me the opportunity to do so. Uh, again, I'm not sure what I'm going to use it for. Maybe create a t shirt design for my Cotton Bureau account. That's always a fun thing to do. Uh, you can find a link to that on my People Love Process page on my website. Once again, you can access that by going to PPL luv.com it'll forward you to the page on my site and uh, you'll be able to see all the tools i use uh, you'll be able to access uh, all the t-shirts i create my book etc and all of that helps support this channel so anything you can do uh, like that is greatly appreciated um, i just hope these methods uh, that you picked up while watching me work on this is going to help you to improve your own workflow. That's my whole goal with doing this channel. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below once this uh, uh, video goes live because I answer all the questions people ask. Remember, the exercise files for each of my People of Process movies can always be accessed via a link in the description below. A big thank you to those who have and to those who have also become members of this channel or subscribed as well, I can't thank you enough for supporting what I'm doing. I enjoy doing it. Hopefully you enjoy watching it. And until next time, thank you for watching People of Process. And as always, I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.